before we get started with the talk. The first is that we'll be having some outreach events that we'll be looking for volunteers to help with in the beginning of March. I think March 2nd to 9th. You can talk to Josh if you want more information about that, and we'll also send out some announcements um, kind of requesting assistance from that in early March. Um, the second announcement is that Form Labs, um, their speaker, um, or one of our previous speakers, um, Andrew Goldman from a while ago, asked to let you all know that we're hiring or that they're hiring at Form Labs. And if you're interested, um, I was looking at their website today, they have some optical um, engineer positions open. So if you, you know, they invite you to check those out because you're kind of the people that would be a good fit. Um, and then lastly, after the talk tonight, we'll have to leave this room. So we ask that you we do our conversation and uh, badgering of Connor in the atrium so that they can clean up the space. So we say something about the next talk and stuff. Oh, uh, uh, I'll yeah. say it if you want. Yeah, go ahead, David. Um, yeah, just the, the uh, talk next month is um, uh, uh, not what was originally posted, but if you go back, I uh, put up the abstract and yeah. the real. Um, all right, sorry, for the people on Zoom. Um, uh, yeah, so what is time of flight photography? Right, still not. So time of flight photography combines two different ways of sensing the world using light, uh, photography and LIDAR. Uh, so everybody here is familiar with photography. Um, in photography, you point your camera at the scene that you want to image. Uh, light travels from the scene uh, to your camera's aperture, where the lens forms it into an image on the sensor plane. Uh, your image sensor records a measurement uh, that's equivalent to a 2D measurement of the intensity of incident light as a function of the incident's angle. Uh, 
Um, so another way of sensing the world using light is with LIDAR. And so LIDAR is effectively echolocation using laser pulses. So you illuminate the scene uh, with time modulated laser light, like a laser pulse. Uh, the light travels into the scene where it scatters off of things. And then some of that scattered light returns to your LIDAR receiver. Um, the raw measurement recorded by a LIDAR system is a LIDAR waveform. Uh, the LIDAR waveform. Uh, and so uh, LIDAR waveform just measures the intensity of the received light as a function of the light's time of flight. And so the real power in LIDAR systems comes in this time of flight measurement. Uh, so conventional LIDAR, uh, conventional cameras are not sensitive to photon time of flight. Uh, flight information is powerful uh, because the speed of light is effectively constant in air. So if you can uh, measure the total time it took for light to travel to the scene and come back, and you can directly compute um, the total distance that that light traveled before you measured it. Um, and if uh, you can further assume that the light scattered only one time before you measured it, then it's straightforward uh, to compute the distance between your LIDAR and the scene. Um, one disadvantage of LIDAR systems, uh, at least historically, um, is that, uh, at least historically, they typically only point in a single direction at a time. Uh, so if you want to acquire an image of the entire scene, you typically have to scan your LIDAR system, the field of view of your LIDAR system across it. Uh, so this is in contrast to a regular camera that can typically acquire an image of the entire scene in a single shot. Um, all right, so back to time of flight photography. All right, so time of flight photography combines the image forming aspect of a regular photography with the time of flight measurement and active illumination of LIDAR. Okay, so like a regular camera, a time of flight camera has a lens and an image sensor, um, but every pixel on that sensor is also sensitive to photon time of flight. Uh, and so this combination ends up being greater than the sum of its parts, uh, which you can tell if you look at the raw data that's captured by a time of flight camera. Um, because uh, if you watch this video for a few more seconds, uh, you'll notice uh, that the raw measurements captured by a time of flight camera are basically equivalent to a video of light as it flows through uh, the image scene. Um, and so when I found out that cameras like this existed, my mind was kind of blown. Uh, I felt like there had to be a million different things that you could do with these cameras, and it seemed like a new imaging modality. Um, so there has been some prior work in time of flight photography. Uh, the first wave of interest was started by a guy named Niels Abramson, who showed that you could record videos of light in flight on holograms. Um, and then the second wave of interest was started um, in the research group of my PhD advisor, Ramesh Raskar, uh, at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and notably, in their paper on femtophotography, uh, they showed that you could implement a time of flight camera with a femtosecond pulse laser and a device called a street camera. Um, they then used that prototype to demonstrate various applications. Uh, most notably, uh, this application in the bottom right, uh, they showed that you could use a time of flight camera to image around corners. Um, but for some reason, after the early 2010s, uh, research in time of flight photography seems to have stagnated. Uh, people still work on it, but the research is increasingly focused on just a few narrow applications and especially this application of imaging around corners. Um, but I would argue that if there were ever a time to revisit time of flight photography and explore everything that you could use it for, uh, that time is now. And I say that primarily due to developments in uh, two technologies. One is a single photon avalanche diode array camera or SPAD array camera. And the other is the vertical cavity surface emitting laser diode or VIXEL. Um, and so what these two technologies have in common is that they can both be printed on CMOS integrated circuits. And so over the past few years, uh, that's enabled a dramatic improvement in the capability of time of flight cameras. Uh, so in 2020, uh, Morimoto et al. demonstrated the first ever megapixel spatter ray camera, uh, at least outside of the defense world. Um, and uh, it's also dramatically decreased the cost of time of flight cameras. Uh, so I'm not sure if everybody here 
uh, knows this, but there's actually been a very capable time of flight camera with a spat array and a Vixel array um, in the iPhone Pro uh, in every model since the iPhone 12 Pro. Um, yeah, and so my point here is that time of flight photography is no longer just an academic curiosity. Uh, there are now millions of people walking around with time of flight cameras in their pockets. Uh, so in my opinion, there's an urgent need to explore just all of the things that you can like camera for. Um, yeah, and so to this end, uh, in my thesis, I developed five new imaging and sensing methods, uh, all of which are enabled by time of flight photography. Uh, a core theme of all of these methods uh, is that each method kind of decodes a different prominent feature that you can see when you look at time of flight photographs. Um, so I'm going to walk through the basic principles of all of these methods. And uh, my hope is that by the time I've finished, I'll have convinced everyone here that, that uh, time of flight photography is useful for all sorts of things, uh, not just imaging around corners. Uh, yeah, so method number one is bounce flash LiDAR. Yeah. So I mentioned uh, that a core theme of my work was decoding uh, the most prominent features that are visible. Uh, so let's take a second look at the time of play photo that I showed earlier in the talk. Uh, when you look at this uh, video, what sticks out to you as the most prominent features here? Um, so to me, uh, the most prominent feature is the bright spot on the right. Um, so that bright spot corresponds to a point on the wall that I illuminated directly with my laser. Um, and light from that spot corresponds to light that's scattered exactly one time before uh, the camera detected it. Um, the next most prominent features are these wave fronts that appear to crawl across other surfaces in the scene. Uh, so these wave fronts correspond to light that's scattered exactly two times before returning to the camera. <clears throat> And so almost all LiDAR systems that exist today exclusively rely on these single bounce returns uh, to learn about uh, the illuminated scene. Uh, and I wanted to know if there's anything interesting or useful that we could learn from these uh, two bounce returns. Um, yeah, and so it turns out that it's almost as straightforward to estimate the geometry of a scene from two bounce light as it is to do so with uh, one bounce light. And so this is how you do it. Uh, so you use a focused pulse laser to illuminate a single point in the scene. Uh, is laser visible? Yeah. Um, uh, you can then treat that point as a light source uh, that subsequently illuminates other surfaces in the scene uh, with scattered light. Um, you can determine the position of that light source in the conventional way with the time of flight of single bounce returns and a uh, single bounce range equation. Um, and then once you have the position of this projected light source, um, you can compute the position of incorrectly illuminated points from the time of flight of two bounce returns using a bi-static range equation. Um, if you also measure the intensity of the one bounce and two bounce returns, uh, then it's straightforward to compute the reflectance of each surface using the equations on the bottom right. Uh, but they assume that each surface is a Lambertian reflector um, so the results are only approximate. And uh, yeah, so I call this concept uh, bounce flash LIDAR, and I named it after a technique in photography called bounce flash, uh, where you illuminate your subject indirectly uh, by bouncing light from the camera's flash off the nearby surface like uh, the ceiling. Um, uh, yeah, so why would anybody want to use a bounce flash LIDAR? Uh, so in my opinion, uh, they're primarily uh, two reasons. Uh, so the first reason is that a bounce flash LIDAR has this interesting property that you can place your light source inside the scene that you're imaging. Uh, so this means you could potentially place your light source arbitrarily close to the target that you're interested in. Uh, and that could produce stronger returns off of the target, which would allow you to estimate its geometry uh, more accurately. Um, and the second reason is that uh, many surfaces in the real world scatter light strongly in the forward direction. Um, so an example of this might be black ice that you might encounter on the street. Um, so a conventional LIDAR would have a hard time detecting the black ice because it reflects almost no light directly back to the LIDAR. Uh, but you can imagine that a bounce flash LIDAR might be able to, say, illuminate a point on the back 
of a truck that was in front of the black ice and then measure uh, the two bounce return that reflects off of the black ice near the specular angle. Um, uh, yeah, and so we were able to demonstrate uh, this bounce flash ladder concept experimentally. And so this slide illustrates our signal processing pipeline. Um, no, mouse also doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so on the, we would start with a raw time of flight photograph. Uh, from these raw measurements, we would extract the two bounce time of flight and the two bounce energy uh, at each pixel. Um, and we would also extract the one bounce time of flight and energy at the pixels that contained the laser spot. Um, using our time of flight estimates, we would compute the range to all pixels in the scene. And then given that range map and our two bounce energy estimates, we would compute the reflectance uh, to all pixels uh, in the scene. Uh, and then our, so our final range and reflectance maps are shown on the right. Connor, do you want an old school pointer? Uh, yeah. I could be, I'm worried about the mic, like, I won't be able to speak into the microphone. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Please speak loudly. I will be able to hear what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. And so our, our final range and reflectance maps are shown here on the right. To, to get reflectance out of this, do you, do you have to get the return from your original illumination point? Uh, yes. Yeah. That outside of the scene can't reflect this. Uh, yes. All the, yeah, this assumes that the laser spot is in the field of view of your camera. Uh, you could also potentially have like a, a separate, yeah. Um, yeah. Or like a separate, you could have a camera looking in one direction and just like a, a regular LIDAR looking in a, another direction to, in the same direction as the illumination. Um, uh, yeah, so the final range and reflectance maps are shown on the right. Uh, and if you look closely at these, you'll notice that the, they have gaps in them. Uh, and some of these gaps are due to shadows that are cast with respect to the, the laser spot, which is over here. Um, and so these shadows actually represent, uh, the core weakness of bounce flash LIDAR. Um, you would not measure shadows like this with a conventional LIDAR. Um, but fortunately, this weakness is really easy to overcome if you just illuminate a few different points in the scene in sequence. Um, and so that's what we did here. We illuminated four different points. Uh, they're marked with the red stars. Um, we treated each point as a projected light source and computed a separate range and reflectance map uh, for each projected light source. We would then take the uncertainty weighted average um, of all of the of the range and reflectance estimates for all unshadowed pixels, uh, and that would allow us to compute these combined range and reflectance maps that you can see on the right. Uh, you notice there are no gaps due to shadows in these combined uh, range reflectance maps. Yeah. Um, okay, that was bounce flash lidar, and now method number two: the imaging behind occluders using shadows. Um, yeah, so as I just showed, uh, shadows are prominent feature in bounce flash LiDAR measurements. Uh, previously, I was considering shadows as a weakness that had to be overcome, uh, but shadows actually contain a lot of useful information that we can use to learn more about the scene. Um, so to provide an example of this, uh, imagine that you're in your kitchen and you want to know what's underneath this chair. Uh, but for whatever reason, you can't kneel down to look underneath the chair. Uh, maybe you have arthritis, maybe you're a disembodied security camera, um, I don't know. Uh, from this single viewpoint, could you tell what's underneath that chair? Um, so what if I gave you a laser pointer? Uh, do you figure out what's underneath the chair now? Um, and so this is what was underneath the chair. Uh, so yeah, I didn't expect anyone to guess that there was a Barack Obama action figure underneath the chair. Um, but my main point, uh, you can see, is that these shadows carry a lot of information about the shapes of these hidden objects. Um, yeah, so it's actually relatively straightforward to interpret this information. 
Yeah, so what we've done is we've illuminated a point on a surface lying to one side of a hidden space. Um, and then we've measured two bounce light uh, that scatters off of a surface on the opposite side of the hidden space. And so if we observe that light can travel from the laser spot to a second point on the opposite side of the hidden space uh, without getting occluded or blocked, uh, then we can infer that um, all points that lie in the line segment uh, between, say, L2 and C2 uh, have to be unoccupied. Um, and so that's the basic observation that, that underlies our method for imaging behind occluders with shadows. Um, yeah, and so we use this principle uh, to develop a space carving procedure uh, for extracting the full 3D of a hidden scene uh, from a set of shadows. And so again, what we'd, we'd do is we would illuminate a point on a surface lying to one side of a hidden space, and then we would observe shadows that were cast uh, by hidden objects on the surfaces lying on the opposite side of the hidden space. Uh, we would then represent the hidden space as a 3D grid of points, and we would carve away or throw away uh, all points that did not project from the position of the laser spot to the positions of shadowed pixels. Um, but uh, a single shadow doesn't have enough information in it to extract the full 3D shape of the hidden scene. Uh, so we then move the laser spot, observe another set of shadows, carve away more points, uh, move the laser spot again, observe yet more shadows, carve away yet more points, and so on, uh, until eventually the uncarved points that remained uh, would closely resemble the 3D shape of the hidden scene. Um, like doing a CAT scan or an MRI. You take the data that you've got there and do a red on transform in it in order to get the actual shape. It's actually, it's extremely close to a CT scan. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, limited baseline. And then the objects are completely opaque instead of like bone would be partially opaque to x rays. Or, yeah. So it changes the math a little bit. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and so this animation on the right just kind of shows how our, illustrates how our space carving procedure works. So as we observe more shadows, we carve away more points, um, and eventually we're left with the shape of the, the hidden scene. Yeah, and then we were also able to apply our space carving algorithm to our uh, bounce flash LiDAR data. Um, in this case, we actually illuminated 16 different points in this scene. So we measured uh, six sets of shadows. And uh, while this scene didn't have any hidden objects in it per se, uh, we can use it to recover of the back facing surfaces, these two, which is a useful application in and of itself. Yeah, the reconstruction is here. Um, uh, yeah. How, how big is your pseudo movement? <laughs> I like the word pseudo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I should have cut this off, so maybe it would have looked like a real room, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's two meters across, uh, so it's maybe like a half-scale room, um, but it was just, uh, it was in our optics lab, so I just wanted to put something in the optics lab that looked like it wasn't an optics lab. Um, that's my nice. main goal. <laughs> I think they didn't wrap too much, but... What limits your resolution? Was it, hmm. you didn't make it small just because that's resolution or um, whatever? Yeah, I think, no, I think this would have worked in a, yeah, a full scale room. Uh, one, uh, although we were kind of, so one limitation is that the signal gets weaker if you bounce light off of a wall over here and you have to measure the two bounce light that's uh, further away. Um, uh, but for a lab experiment, we could just integrate for longer, so it wouldn't have been that much of an issue. Um, but, um, yeah. You mentioned earlier, like, there's like a megapixel spat array. That right. This was done maybe a couple of years ago. What, what the sensor rest Okay. Like, uh, yeah, so there's kind of a, some slate of hand here. Uh, so I was doing this to demonstrate the concept, but my camera was actually, uh, we didn't have access to a good SPAT array when I did these experiments. So I simulated one by just uh, scanning the field of view of a single SPAD across a 200 by 200 grid. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, um, yeah, but even a lot of the best ones are, they're still like, um, like big companies have access to them, but academics don't. So it's, it's kind of a, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So then on this slide, I just want to, uh, show a couple of experiments that we did to demonstrate potential applications of imaging behind includers. Uh, so in this experiment on the top, uh, so imagine that you're in your car and you're driving down the street. Uh, and unbeknownst to you, there's a child that's about to run out into the street. Uh, you can't see the child because he's hidden behind uh, this parked truck. Um, if you had a bounce flash LIDAR, you might be able to illuminate points on buildings lying to one side of the, the truck and measure shadows that were cast onto the street or vice versa. Uh, by doing this, you could image the space behind the truck, uh, detect that there was a kid there, and hopefully take evasive action. Um, and then in this experiment on the bottom. Uh, so imagine that you're a firefighter and you want to look inside a building. Um, the building has windows, but you can't see the space in between the windows. Uh, so if you had a bounce flash slider system, you could illuminate points that are visible uh, through one window and observe shadows, the hidden objects cast on the surfaces visible through a second window. Uh, by doing this, you could image the space in between the windows. Um, and in this case, detect uh, two people there. Um, uh, yeah, all right. So method number three is uh, estimating spatially varying BRDF in the wild. Um, yeah, so, so far I've shown that the two bounce returns measured by a time of flight camera can be useful, useful for estimating the geometry of visible surfaces uh, and that the shadows in those two bounce returns can be useful for estimating the geometry of hidden surfaces. Uh, so in this section, I'll show that there's at least one more useful property of the scene uh, that we can extract from two bounce returns, uh, and that's the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, or BRDF, of surfaces. Um, yeah, so the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, or BRDF, is a four-dimensional function that describes the reflectance of a point as a function of the direction of incoming light and the direction of outgoing uh, scattered light. The spatially varying BRDF or SVBRDF is a six dimensional function that simply describes uh, the BRDF at all points on a two dimensional surface. Um, so knowing the SVBRDF of a surface is critical if you wanna be able to describe how its appearance will change as the illumination changes. Um, and if you can measure the SVBRDF of a surface, uh, then it can reveal important physical properties of the surface. Uh, for a simple example, uh, Rough surfaces like concrete can scatter light broadly in a wide range of directions, uh, regardless of what direction they're illuminated from, whereas smoother surfaces like plastic tend to scatter light in a more directional way, and this produces more of a glossy appearance. Um, uh, so the typical way to measure the SVBRDF of a... Uh, do you have a question? No, okay. Uh, the typical way to measure the SVBRDF of a surface is by photographing and illuminating the surface from a wide variety of angles. Uh, and so this is this is feasible in a controlled studio setting, uh, becomes infeasible in uncontrolled environments or in the wild. Um, uh, yeah, and so as an example of this, uh, here I took photos of four materials that have dramatically different uh, BRDF characteristics, uh, but you couldn't tell that uh, just from these photos. Um, but now here are photos of the same four materials, except this time I've shined a laser pointer on all of them. And you can see the two bounce returns that scatter off of the wall behind uh, the material samples. And so while it's hard to uh, differentiate the BRDF characteristics of the samples from these regular photographs, uh, their two bounce returns are you know, unmistakably distinct. Um, and that's caused by their BRDS. Uh, so this material on the left has sort of a rough sandpaper surface. Uh, and so it scatters light in a wide range of directions. Uh, the second material has a smoother glazed surface. So it scatters light in a more directional way. Um, this third material is sort of a polished marble. Uh, so some light reflects directly off of the surface like a mirror and the rest of the light refracts into the material 
where it bounces around randomly before emerging in a wide range of directions. Uh, and then this final material on the right has an interesting uh, brushed metal finish. So it scatters light specularly along one axis and diffusely uh, along the perpendicular axis. Um, yeah, so it's clear that these two bounce returns uh, reveal a lot of information about materials uh, BRDFs. And so my goal is to come up with an algorithm that can estimate the BRDF of all points in the scene simultaneously uh, from uh, two bounce and bounce flash LIDAR measurements. Um, and so to reduce the dimensionality of this problem, uh, I assume that the BRDF of all points in the scene uh, can be modeled with this four parameter BRDF model that's based on the uh, Disney BRDF uh, published by Brent Burley. And so the parameters of this model are a diffuse reflection, uh, diffuse reflectance term, uh, the surface roughness, the Fresnel factor, which is a function of the material's uh, index of refraction, uh, and a subsurface parameter that interpolates between a uh, diffuse reflectance model that's closer to concrete and another one that's closer to skin. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, so once the BRDF model is defined, the radiometric model is relatively straightforward uh, to write down. Uh, so as a reminder, a bounce flash LiDAR system uh, will observe a one bounce return and a two bounce return. Um, and so the intensity of one bounce returns is just the product of an instrumental calibration parameter, which accounts for things like aperture size of your camera, a geometry term, uh, which accounts for effects like radial fall off, and then the BRDF of the first surface. Um, and then the intensity of the two bounce return is just the product of an instrumental calibration term, a geometry term, and then the product of the BRDFs of the first and the second uh, surface. Um, yeah, and so again, my goal is to come up with an algorithm uh, that can estimate uh, all four BRDF parameters uh, for all points in the scene simultaneously with a set of bounce flash LIDAR measurements. Um, uh, yeah, and so on the right, this animation shows a set of simulated bounce flash LIDAR measurements. Um, and so we illuminated a handful of points in the scene uh, in sequence. Those are marked with the white dots. And then uh, we observed two bounce returns from all of the unshadowed points uh, in the scene. And so once we have a set of bounce flash LIDAR measurements, uh, we could form this weighted least squares loss function. Uh, and so this loss function just compares uh, the measured one bounce and two bounce energies uh, with the one bounce and two bounce energies that we would predict with our radiometric model uh, for our current estimate of the scene's uh, BRDF parameters. And so our goal was to choose the BRDF parameters uh, for the scene that minimize this loss function. Um, and so to minimize this loss function, uh, we came up with a, an alternating Newton step algorithm. Uh, and so the way it would work is we would divide the scene into two different sets of points. Uh, the first set included just the directly illuminated points. And the second set uh, included the points that were only ever illuminated uh, indirectly. Um, uh, we would then perform an alternating optimization. So we would fix the parameters of the indirectly illuminated points and only optimize the parameters of the directly illuminated points. And we would then switch it up and fix the parameters of the directly illuminated points, only update the parameters of the indirectly illuminated points. And we would alternate between these two steps uh, until the BRDF parameters of all points in the scene uh, converged to their true value. Um, and so the reason we went for this alternating optimization was that when you fix the parameters of either the directly or indirectly illuminated points, then this sum in the loss function becomes separable. With, uh, and so this turns what used to be a gigantic optimization problem that could only be solved slowly with gradient descent uh, into a series of small optimization problems that can be solved uh, quickly in parallel. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so... As I mentioned, this algorithm is only computationally true if we exploit parallel computation. Uh, but by the time I finished my thesis, uh, I wasn't able to implement the full parallel version of the algorithm. Uh, but I was able to validate the method somewhat by implementing a serial version of the algorithm uh, that could only measure the BRDF parameters of uh, directly illuminated points. Um, and so that's what we did uh, in this test. 
we were trying to estimate the BRDF parameters at this point, marked with a red star. Um, and the BRDF parameters of all the indirectly illuminated points were held fixed uh, at their true values. And so this animation on the left shows how our, how our predictions of the two bounce intensities uh, were updated as we updated our estimate of the BRDF parameters. Uh, and then this plot on the right shows how the BRDF parameters converge to their true values within a few uh, iterations. Um, and then I was also able to implement a limited parallel version of the algorithm. So this could optimize um, one of four BRDF parameters, but for all points in the scene simultaneously. Um, and so a test of that version of the algorithm is here. Uh, so this is our, in this test, we were trying to estimate the Fresnel factors of all points in the scene simultaneously. So uh, on the left, this is the our initial guesses for the Fresnel factors. Uh, in the middle is the true values of the Fresnel factors. And then in this animation on the right shows how our estimates converged to the true values in a few iterations. Um, uh, yeah, all right. So method number four, uh, detection and mapping of specular surfaces. Yeah. So, so far I've shown that time of flight photography is useful for estimating the geometry of visible and hidden surfaces. Uh, and it's also useful for estimating the BRDF of surfaces. Uh, in this section, I'm going to show that time of flight photography is particularly useful for estimating the geometry of surfaces that have a very particular BRDF. Uh, and those are specular surfaces. Um, right. uh, so specular or mirror-like surfaces are very common, uh, especially in man-made environments. Uh, they include surfaces like mirrors, uh, windows, polished metal or glass objects, um, and even wet surfaces like puddles. Um, but historically, it's been assumed that LIDAR is just bad at detecting specular surfaces. Uh, and this is because specular surfaces tend to deflect almost all energy in a laser beam uh, in a single direction. So unless the specular surface is oriented at the perfect angle, almost no light gets scattered directly back to the LIDAR receiver. Um, but I wanted to challenge this idea that LIDAR was always bad at detecting specular surfaces, uh, because in many scenarios, uh, specular surfaces produce a unique signature that's actually very easy to detect. Um, and so to provide an example of this, uh, here's a video of me waving a laser around the bathroom. Uh, Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you watch this video, the direct return after the mirror, off of the mirror, uh, is almost always, it's always very faint and possibly too faint to see, uh, but I can still tell that there's a mirror there because whenever I shine my laser at the wall, I see a laser spot on the wall and also it's mirror image, uh, when I look at the mirror and when I illuminate the mirror directly, uh, the beam gets deflected onto the wall. And once again, I see a laser spot on the wall and a uh, laser spot in the mirror. Um, so my point is uh, even though specular surfaces can often produce very faint direct returns, um, if those specular surfaces are embedded in environments that contain lots of diffusely reflecting surfaces, and uh, most indoor spaces would be included in this, and many outdoor spaces would too, um, then they often produce very intense uh, multi-bounce returns that are fairly easy to measure. Um, and so you might be thinking, if these signals are so easy to detect, uh, why have they been overlooked by the LiDAR community for so long? Uh, and my theory for why this is, is that historically, uh, LiDAR systems have been primarily confocal, which means that they transmit and receive light along approximately the same axis. Um, but multi-bounce returns, and specifically, uh, two bounce returns uh, never arrive at your receiver from the same angle that light was transmitted. So a conventional LiDAR system wouldn't detect them. Um, but there is a kind of LiDAR receiver uh, that could detect these two bounce returns, and that's a uh, time of flight camera. Um, uh, yeah, so if a time of flight camera can reliably detect these multi bounce returns, uh, the next question we have to ask is, is there enough information uh, in these multi-bounce returns 
to determine the position of the specular reflector? Um, and so the answer is yes, but we have to consider uh, two different scenarios. Uh, so in this first system on the left, uh, our laser illuminates the diffusely reflecting surface first. And so the, the geometry of this scenario is identical to the geometry of bound flash LIDAR. Um, so again, yeah, we illuminate a point on the diffusely reflecting surface. Um, then this laser spot can then be treated as a light source that subsequently illuminates uh, the rest of the scene. Uh, we can use single bounce time of flight to determine the position of D. And then once we know the position of D, we can use the two bounce time of flight to estimate the position of S uh, using these equations. Um, and then the system on the, the second scenario is only a little bit more complicated, and that's shown on the right. Uh, so in this scenario, we illuminate the specular surface first. Um, and so because we assume that it's a, a ideal specular reflector, uh, we do not measure a one bounce return, uh, but we do measure a two bounce return and a three bounce return. Um, and so I won't go through the arithmetic and trigonometry that went into deriving these expressions, um, but the main point uh, is that if you can measure the time of flight and angle of arrival of the two bounce and three bounce signals, uh, then you can you can compute the distance between the camera and S2 and the camera and D uh, using these equations. Um, and it's also straightforward to compute the position of S1, but I just haven't listed uh, those equations here. Um, uh, yeah, so that's good. Uh, now we know that regardless of which kind of surface we illuminate first, uh, we can always apply a simple set of range equations to determine the positions of all diffuse and specular scattering points. Um, but in order to ensure that we're applying the correct equations to the correct measurements, uh, we have to resolve two ambiguities. Uh, so the first ambiguity is we need to know what kind of surface we illuminated first, either a diffuse surface or a specular uh, surface. Um, and so this problem isn't as straightforward to resolve as you might think. Uh, an example of this is uh, can be seen in this photo that I showed here. Uh, so this is a scene that contains a diffuse reflector, a poster board, and a small mirror. Um, and I could have recreated this exact same photo eliminating either the poster board or the mirror first. Um, in either case, I would see two laser spots, uh, one on each surface. Um, so this brings us to the second ambiguity, which is that if we send our laser beam into a scene that contains specular reflectors, uh, we may observe multiple laser spots in our measurements. Uh, in order to correctly apply our range equations, we need to figure out which laser spot is the true laser spot and which ones are mirror images. Um, fortunately, uh, the second ambiguity is always straightforward to resolve uh, if you have time of flight information. Um, and that's because light from the true laser spot will always arrive at your camera before light from the mirror images, which has to follow an indirect path back to the camera. Um, so to provide some evidence for this, uh, here are two time of flight camera measurements uh, taken for this scene. Uh, and the one on the top, I illuminated the poster board directly. And in the one on the bottom, I illuminated the mirror directly. Um, but you can see in either measurements, uh, light in the true laser spot, the direction of the poster board always arrives before light from the direction of the mirror. Um, uh, yeah, so once we've resolved the second ambiguity, uh, resolving the figuring out which kind of surface we eliminated first is pretty straightforward. Uh, and that's because we know what direction we pointed our laser. Uh, so if we know that we pointed our laser towards the true spot, uh, then we can infer that we illuminated a diffuse surface first. Um, otherwise, we can infer that we illuminated a specular reflector first. Uh, yeah, and so we, we can combine all these concepts to create a simple uh, specular surface scanning procedure uh, shown here. Uh, so we're, uh, we point our time of flight camera at a scene that may contain specular surfaces, and we scan our laser across it. Um, for every direction that we point our laser, we may observe uh, multiple laser spots in our measurements. Uh, so we first have to determine which laser spot is the true laser spot, 
once we've done that, we need to determine which kind of surface we illuminated directly. Um, and once those two ambiguities have been resolved, uh, we can apply the correct set of range equations to compute the positions of all diffuse and specular scattering points. Uh, we can then add those points to our point cloud and continue scanning our laser. Um, and once we've scanned our laser across the entire scene, we'll have a point cloud representation of the scene that contains both diffuse and specular surfaces. Um, and so I can show some of uh, the experimental results that we got for this method. Uh, so in this first experiment, we were uh, trying to uh, scan a scene that contained a tall planar mirror. And our results are shown on the right uh, from various perspectives. Uh, and here, the blue points correspond to points that are on the back wall and the floor, so diffusely reflecting surfaces. And the red and green points correspond to the mirror. Um, and you might notice if you look closely that we also, oh, backwards, uh, that we also plot the surface normals of all points in the specular surface. Uh, it's actually straightforward to compute those uh, using the law of specular reflection. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, in the second experiment, we scanned a similar scene that had a trans uh, glass window in it instead of a mirror. And you can see that, like the first example, we're able to successfully recover uh, the size, shape, uh, position, orientation of the window uh, relative to the back wall. Um, so this is also a successful result. Um, and then, uh, so the last two experiments, uh, in the last two experiments, the specular surfaces in the scene were all planar. Um, but our method is also capable of scanning uh, non-planar specular objects. And so that's what these two uh, results show. Uh, so in this first experiment, we tried to scan the shape of a chrome-plated Boston Terrier piggy bank, uh, which is shown here. Um, and uh, our results are shown on the bottom left. And so the red points correspond to points on the dog. And I don't know about you guys, but to me, this resembles the shape of a dog. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah. And then this in this experiment on the right was pretty interesting. We were trying to scan a thin glass vase. And so because the vase was transparent, um, we could observe two bounce returns off of both the front surface of the vase and the internal back surface of the vase. So that means that even though we only ever viewed the vase from the front, we were able to reconstruct both the geometry of both the front and the back surfaces. Um, uh, yeah, and then I don't have time to go through these concepts uh, during this talk, uh, but if you read our paper, uh, we also consider the scenario where the scene contains transparent specular surfaces that have objects behind them. Uh, this situation presents ambiguities and we provide guidance on how to resolve those ambiguities. Um, and then we also propose an algorithm uh, for uh, scanning scenes with specular surfaces when the scene is illuminated with a multi-beam flash. Uh, so like 100 beams simultaneously. Uh, and the point here is that this should allow for faster scene acquisition. Um, uh, yeah, and so and now finally reached the, uh, the final section of the talk. Uh, and that's on measuring snow properties using time domain diffuse optics. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody here has a background in computer graphics, uh, but if you did, you'd notice a pattern uh, in the talk, which is that I've been successively applying uh, physics concepts in computer graphics to time of flight photography. Okay. So first, I just considered the effects of scene geometry. Uh, after that, I considered the mutual visibility between points, which is what produces shadows. Um, after that, I considered the bidirectional reflectance of surfaces, and then the special case of reflections. Um, so after those four uh, phenomena, I would argue that the next most significant physical phenomena treated by computer graphics is uh, subsurface scattering. Uh, and so that's what I consider in this section. Um, yeah, so subsurface scattering is most noticeable in material highly scattering media. Uh, so these materials include uh, clouds, skin, uh, coffee, if you put milk in it, uh, candle wax, and then the material that I'm considering in this, uh, this work, snow. Um, and so when a photon strikes a highly scattering medium, it can be scattered into the medium, where it will then bounce around randomly before emerging from the surface at a random position 
and in a random direction. Um, yeah, and then uh, snow. Why do we care about snow? Uh, well, snow is important. Uh, at the planetary scale, uh, snow plays an important role in regulating the Earth's climate. Uh, because snow is highly reflective, uh, when a larger fraction of the Earth's surface is covered by snow, uh, then a larger fraction of sunlight gets reflected away back to space instead of absorbed as heat. Um, at a regional scale, snow serves as an important source of fresh water for people. Uh, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, up to 75% of all water resources in the western U.S. are sourced from snowmelt. Um, and then at the local scale, snow can pose a hazard, uh, most dramatically in the form of avalanches, which kill approximately 25 people in the U.S. Uh, every year. Um, yeah, so to connect snow and subsurface scattering, um, if you ever walk out at night and point a laser pointer at a snowbank, uh, as one does, uh, <laughs> you would <laughs> you would notice that light tends to spread spread out pretty far beneath the surface uh, before it gets scattered out of the snow. Um, and this happens primarily for two reasons. Uh, so the first reason uh, is that ice is an extremely weak absorber of light at visible wavelengths. Um, so this means that when a photon enters a snowpack, it can scatter thousands of times within it without getting absorbed. Um, and then the second reason is that the mean free path of a photon in snow is typically on the order of one millimeter. So thousands of scattering events times one millimeter per scattering event means that a photon that enters a snowpack um, can travel for several meters beneath the surface along random twisted paths uh, before getting scattered back out. Um, and so these long path lengths underneath the surface virtually guarantee that light backscattered by snow will have interacted very strongly with the snow volume. And so it's reasonable fact uh, that measurements of this light could tell us something about the snow's properties. Um, and then these long path lengths should also impart a significant time delay on the light, which you can measure with a LIDAR or a time of light camera. Um, and so the questions that motivated this work were A, um, if I were to illuminate snow with a laser pulse, uh, what would the backscattered light look like to a time of flight camera? Uh, and then B, uh, could measurements like this be used to estimate any important snow properties? Um, yeah. And so to answer the first question, um, fortunately, a lot of research has already gone into modeling the time-dependent reflectance um, of light by highly scattering media. Uh, this research has mostly gone on in the biomedical optics community, um, where they're very interested in coming up with new ways to measure properties of uh, human tissue, which is also highly scattering. Um, and so most of the models in that literature rely on what's known as the diffusion approximation to the radiative transfer equation. Uh, and so under the diffusion approximation, photons are modeled as particles that diffuse within the medium. Um, and so an advantage of using the diffusion approximation uh, is that it permits analytical solutions when the geometry of the scattering medium is sufficiently simple. And so a slab of snow fits that description. Um, so I pretty much just bor borrowed my model from the biomedical optics literature. And so the model can be seen right here. Um, and so this model describes the scenario that's illustrated on the top left. Um, so here I illuminate the snow with a laser pulse at one point. And then a detector measures the intensity versus time of light that exits the snow from a second point uh, that's separated from the laser spot by a few centimeters. Um, and then on the bottom right, I compare the predictions of my model in the red curve uh, with a set of simulated photon count measurements uh, generated by Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and you can say that you can see that at least with the simulated measurements, the results match really closely. Um, yeah. Uh, and so this is great. We now have a model for the time-dependent reflectance of a scattering medium, uh, but we're not done yet uh, because this model is still defined in terms of phenomenological properties of the medium, like the absorption coefficient, the scattering coefficient, and the mean speed of light. Um, it would be much more useful if we could define this model in terms of physically meaningful snow properties. Um, and so uh, to do this, uh, I adopted a me scattering model, uh, which makes the approximation that the grains in the snow can be approximated as spheres. Uh, 
Uh, but if you can accept that approximation, uh, then the effective scattering coefficient, the absorption coefficient, and the mean speed of light in the snow uh, can all be written in terms of just three snow properties, uh, which are the ice volume fraction, grain size, and uh, concentration of light absorbing impurities. Okay, so I'll walk through those. Uh, so the ice volume fraction is equivalent to the snow's density. Uh, so this controls whether the snow uh, is either fluffy light powder or hard and packed down or somewhere in between. Uh, the grain size can be thought of more as a feature size of the snow. So freshly fallen snow tends to have uh, very fine features. You can think snowflakes. Uh, but as the snow ages, size uh, tends to increase and uh, the grains start to resemble these larger rounded grains shown on the right. Um, and then uh, the third parameter is the concentration of light absorbing impurities in the snow. Uh, this basically describes how dirty the snow is. Um, in this work, I assume that the impurity in the snow was uh, black carbon, which is in soot. Um, but it would be straightforward to swap out black carbon for any other impurity or combination of impurities, uh, so like dust or algae. Um, yeah, so now that we have a model uh, that can be written in terms of physically meaningful snow properties, uh, the next step is to try to estimate those properties in real snow samples. And so this is how we did it. Uh, basically, we filled a cooler with snow. Uh, we then illuminated a point on the surface of the snow with a pulse laser and used a SPAD detector uh, to measure the time of flight of photons that exited the snow a uh, small distance away from the laser spot. Um, we would collect two time of flight histograms using uh, two different lasers, uh, one red laser and one near infrared laser. Um, and we would then fit curves to each of the histograms uh, that had the same form as our photon diffusion model. Um, after doing these curve fits, we would invert the curve fits uh, to find the snowpack properties that best fit our measurements. All the way on the right. Um, uh, yeah, and then we validated our method in two sets of experiments. Uh, so in the first set of experiments, uh, we collected five different five natural snow samples uh, that we knew had uh, varying densities and grain sizes, and we tried to estimate their properties. Um, so and our results are shown here. Uh, the best result is on the left. These are our estimates of the ice volume fraction or density of the snow. Um, and these results look good to us uh, because there's a, just a very strong correlation between our estimates and the ground truth values. Um, and the correlation was relatively close to one-to-one. -one. Um, but we saw much stronger biases in our estimates of grain size and black carbon concentrations. And my theory for why these biases were there uh, was model match. Uh, so the biases and size estimates uh, can be reasonably explained by the fact that we assume that the ice grains were spheres. Um, and so in future work, we want to adopt a more nuanced uh, scattering model that can account for non-spherical ice grains. Um, and then the biases and our black carbon concentration estimates uh, can be plausibly explained by the presence of impurities in the snow uh, that weren't black carbon, uh, like dirt. Um, yeah, uh, this last point, uh, in our second set of experiments, um, we collected, uh, several snow samples that all had very similar densities and grain sizes, but we then added varying concentrations of, uh, black carbon soot to these samples, and we tried to estimate the concentration. Um, yeah, and so our results are shown on the right, and so even though we don't have that many data points, uh, this result was really encouraging. Because it seems to show a really one-to-one -one, uh, correlation between our estimates of black carbon and our ground truth measurements of black carbon. Um, and uh, so this indicates that when we know that the impurity in the snow is black carbon, that we can estimate its concentration uh, relatively accurately. Um, yeah, uh, and so now I've reached the end of the talk. Uh, so in summary, uh, I've introduced five new imaging and sensing methods that are all enabled by time of flight photography. Uh, first, I introduced a new mode of LiDAR imaging called bounce flash LiDAR, uh, where we use the time of flight 
of two bounce returns to estimate a scene's geometry. Uh, after that, I show that the shadows visible in two bounce measurements uh, can be used to estimate the geometry of uh, hidden objects. Um, after that, I showed that the information in two bounce returns is sufficient to estimate the BRDF of surfaces. Um, after that, I showed that the multi bounce returns measured by a time of flight camera um, can be used to estimate the geometry of specular or mirror like surfaces. Um, and then finally, I showed that time resolved measurements of light that scatters beneath the surface of snow can be used to estimate the snow's properties. Um, yeah, and so after listening to me for an hour, I hope that I've convinced you all uh, that time of flight photography is useful for all sorts of things, uh, not just imaging around corners. Um, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you, Connor. Um, I guess we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Amy. Let's laser power. Oh, I'm sorry. What is your laser power, and particularly in the snow case, do you have heat and melting? And the biomedical right. application in a lot of cases is breast cancer, for example. Right. Do you yeah. do you risk helping your patient? They're kind of uh, a fun question there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, the power of the laser we were using in the snow experiments was actually really, uh, it was like, um, it was like half of a milliwatt something. Um, so, but we also, um, we also stared at the snow for, uh, several hours for each measurement. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, that's something that in the next paper, we're going, hoping to improve on that by a couple orders of magnitude, but. But I don't think it would re require a very powerful laser. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think an eye safe laser would be sufficient for the snow. Uh, the reason why we had to integrate for so long in the snow experiments was that our um, our detector was pretty far from the snow surface. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. you said you. Um... Base these five methods on five different physical relations that are used in with computer graphics. Right. Have you, yeah. In computer graphics, they're all combined. Have you tried to combine any of these, or is that that's probably way beyond the PhD thesis? Um. Ah, well, yeah. So that is one thing. That's like kind of a dream. Yeah, is to take a set of measurements with a time of flight camera. Uh, yeah, and then use all of these methods together to get the yeah, the geometry of the visible scene and then hidden objects and the BRDF. But, but you mean uh, for, for another student to try to combine, you know, at least two of these? Uh, I guess that's for another student. I, the only combination I've done so far is um, in the bounce flash LIDAR paper, I use bounce flash LIDAR and I also use the shadows uh, to image behind occluders, but I haven't combined them. Um, yeah. <laughs> just following yeah. up on that question, you know, yeah. it makes me think that, I mean, this is really just the beginning, not only besides combining these five, but if you use different wavelengths, you suddenly get into spectroscopy and you could identify yeah. various materials. And then way at yeah. the other end of the spectrum, you could suddenly use yeah. entangled light and go much, yeah, much I, further. So there's a huge opening here. Trying to here. avoid the entangled. <laughs> Making the experiments a lot better. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I agree. Uh, like nobody's ever even um, done time of flight photography plus color. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's so much you could learn about that. Like, uh, you know, light separates into colors when it passes through a refractive medium. So even if you don't see it from the side, like white light goes into the glass, it would be when it comes out, you'd see blue first, then yellow than red and you know, stuff like that. So yeah, there's even the classical of, correlations yeah. between the different ones, first and second order that you could add to this. So right. it's it's really yeah. just the beginning. It's wide opening for you. So I, I'd say well, I one last question and then we'll we should buy that out to the atrium and continue uh, the discussion there. Sure. Uh yeah. Look. 
Um, when I first learned about BRDS, I thought, oh my God, that is an insanely complicated thing because you have to do it from so many angles and so many possibilities. Right. And even looking at what you did there, okay, you bounced off someplace and now yeah. you're getting you're getting uh impact from a number of different angles and things, you're still not doing it completely. So are you making assumptions about the BRDF? Right. And uh, the second thing, second part of this is yeah. the BRDF probably should also include polarization. Yeah. Uh Okay, so yeah, I guess, yeah, two parts. Um, so yeah, so to the first part of the question, uh, yeah, so every bounce flash LIDAR measurement yeah. uh, collects, basically, it can collect up to a two-dimensional slice of the BRDF, which is a four-dimensional function. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't think you can measure all entries of the 4D function uh, just with bounce flash measurement. Uh, but there are some papers that have uh, been published that look at like um, even though BRDFs are technically four dimensional functions, mm -hmm. uh, almost all materials uh, in the re real world have BRDFs with certain properties. Uh, and so, if you can model, so that's why so I use this parametric model. Um, and so, as you can sample the angles that tend to encode information about the various, uh, like there's always a specular component, a diffuse component. Sometimes there's like a retro reflective component. Uh, as long as you can sample angles in those regions, uh, you usually have enough information. Well, hopefully, I've only shown it on simulated data so far, but hopefully, hope is you'd have enough. Okay. But you're, I, I assume you're extrapolating yeah. or, or something to fill in the rest of the gaps. Um, yeah, well, so we, we're using a parametric model. So we're just okay. estimating four parameters. Mm -hmm. And then the parameters will have errors in them when we estimate them. Mm -hmm. But once you have the parameters, you can define it just a function. Uh, you can in input angles, output here. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then in terms of polarimetric uh, BRDF, um, that's something that I would love to look at um, because uh yeah reflections and especially like specular reflections tend to <clears throat> yeah add polarization with each reflection um so i haven't looked at that yet but it's it's an idea that we've talked about okay cool yeah. well thanks Connor. um yeah welcome you to continue to be on the question that welcome to keep our space <laughs> yeah <laughs> My question. Well, I can argue while you're finishing out. Um, Josh, 